As far as you, I or anyone else without a business expense account is concerned, the i7-5960X was the first widely available 8-core CPU. Yes, there were 8-core Xeons and Opterons before it, but the people who originally bought those chips weren't putting them in gaming PCs. AMD, at least at one point, would have told you that their bulldozer CPUs had 8 cores, but the state of California would beg to differ. Whatever else came before, the i7-5960X was the first 8-core CPU that gamers would have wanted to buy, whether or not they needed it in 2014. With over half a dozen iterations of Intel CPU having followed it, does Haswell E still hold up? Um, hell yeah. Just to clear up some confusion at the start, the i7-5960X is one of Intel's high-end desktop, or HEDT, chips. The model numbers in this series don't line up with your normal CPUs. The 5000 series on Socket 2011 V3 are on the same 22 nanometer architecture as the 4000 series chips on Socket 1150. These Haswell E-chips can therefore be expected to have similar per-thread performance to an i7-4770K, but with a few major advantages. The obvious first benefit is core count. The i7-5960X leads the i7 Extreme range in this regard, but there were Xeons with even more, and even the entry-level i7-5820K has six cores, up from the four of the previous generation i7-4820K. These cores are accompanied by extra cash, a factor which has proven to be extremely relevant in gaming. Haswell E also holds an advantage in terms of RAM. The X99 boards used for this platform were, I believe, the first to use DDR4, though the newness and relative immaturity of the memory controllers mean you don't often see it used much above 2666 megatransfers a second. Like with X79 before it, the X99 platform supports quad-channel memory, with twice the bandwidth of dual-channel RAM at the same speed, going some way to making up for the lack of raw clock speeds. Games were not made with 16 threads in mind back in 2014, and many games still don't fully use that power today. Even now, CPUs that trade clock speeds for core counts will often find themselves at a disadvantage compared to even an i5 of the same era. Thankfully, the i7-5960X, like the other i7s on the platform, have unlocked multipliers for overclocking, and after taking a somewhat heavy-handed approach to voltages, I was able to drag mine kicking and screaming to the same 4.5GHz as was used for my previous HEDT CPU reviews. To achieve this, I'm using a Gigabyte X99 G1 gaming Wi-Fi motherboard and a Cooler Master 240mm AIO. The rest of the specs consist of four 8GB sticks of DDR4-4000 running at 3200CL16, and as usual, my GPU of choice is the RTX 3070. My starter title for CPU benchmarks is one that doesn't really benefit much from high core counts. Valorant just wants your cash, and it wants your clocks. The 5960X evidently has more than enough of both as it racks up an enormous 330 FPS on average, with 1% lows of 180. Not to spoil a future video too much, but this puts it in the same territory as a Ryzen 5 5600G, and while still 30% lower than a 5600X, this is still pretty remarkable. Battlefield 5 might not be the newest title in the series, but for all the interest 2042 received, it might as well be. It also takes advantage of higher thread count CPUs, but normally in DX12 it can be something of a stuttery mess, particularly in older architectures. Haswell E, however, handles it like a champ. Averages exceed 170 FPS and are about on level with the far newer 6-core Ryzen 5 5600X. And while lows are still pretty gnarly, and you'll probably still want a game in DX11 to get a smoother experience, it's a night and day difference from previous generation HEDT chips. <music> 
Fortnite Chapter 4 has received a ton of fancy new effects from the port to Unreal 5, but I'll be saving those for the GPU reviews. In performance mode, Fortnite becomes much more CPU bound, and it would take a much higher end chip than this to max out the RTX 3070. Still, if you're a lucky swine with a 240Hz monitor, the 5960X can more than deliver the goods. Averages come in just below 290 and 1%s just below 120, though the 0.1% scores still remind us that this is Fortnite and some things just don't change. So, here's a surprise new entry for 2023. I used to benchmark Overwatch 2 in this spot, but I decided that three multiplayer shooters was enough. Microsoft Flight Simulator is a bit of a bear on both CPUs and GPUs, and as such I've been relatively conservative with quality settings. At the high-end presets 2560x1440 with DLSS quality enabled, the GPU is only being used up to about 60-70%. to Cruising over Manhattan, this delivers just shy of 60fps. If you have enough GPU horsepower, I dare say less CPU intensive destinations will achieve a higher average but I went with NYC to showcase some of the tougher conditions the CPU might face. As this is a new addition to the benchmark roster, I've added a couple of CPUs whose reviews I haven't published yet for comparison. From flying high above Manhattan to swinging through it, Spider-Man Remastered doesn't need me to be too careful with quality settings. At 1440, very high, with DLSS dropping render resolution effectively below 1080p, the RTX 3070 is once more only operating at about two-thirds capacity. That being said, the CPU is still enough to deliver a near 100fps experience at these settings. Turning on ray tracing sends GPU usage up into the 80s and 90s, but the CPU is still taking a beating, up from about 60% usage without RT to the mid and high 70s with it. FPS drops to 66 on average, once more bringing this about level with a Ryzen 5600G. Cyberpunk 2077 once more sees some amazing performances from the 5960X. The standard non-RT run involves using the ultra-quality preset at 1440 with DLSS Q, and most of the CPUs I've tested so far can't keep up with the GPU for the whole run. As I get closer to the city centre and the number of NPCs and cars goes up, GPU utilisation usually drops. Not here. The 5960X can keep the 3070 at 95-98% usage almost the whole time, delivering a 74fps average that actually just barely beats the Ryzen 5 5600X. With RT enabled, the score is closer to a tie, but the 1%s are actually slightly above the 6-year younger Ryzen. And again, the i7-5960X continues to impress in Red Dead Redemption 2. At 1440 with DLSS quality and with the slider set to the first prefer quality preset, this CPU once more manages to keep up with the 3070. GPU utilisation remains in the high 90s, only dipping occasionally down into the 80s. For context, even the best of the older CPUs I've tested tend to oscillate between 60 and 80% GPU usage. This high utilisation is reflected in the frame rate, scoring a pretty amazing 91 FPS. I usually say that Elden Ring's 60 FPS cap isn't an issue with the CPUs I test, as at 1440 max settings, even 7th gen i7 quad cores dip below the cap often enough to drag the averages down. Well, the 5960X renders Elden Ring's performance quite boring, averaging 59.7 with 1% in the low 50s. My gameplay was more thrown off by the fact that my wired Xbox 360 controller died and my wireless Xbox One controller's added latency has completely thrown off my parry timing. Finally, fans of Civilization VI will have absolutely no interest in this old i7, and should pick up the Ryzen 5 5600X instead. This CPU's 6.68 second average turn time is utterly eclipsed by the newer CPU's 6.67 second turn time. I 
don't think I expected the i7-5960X to be quite this special. Although I haven't tested the i7-4960X, which is its immediate predecessor, the gap between this and the 3960X at the same clock speed is phenomenal. It's not just that it scores between 10 and 20% higher in AAA titles, nor that it scores up to 50% faster in some of the higher FPS competitive titles. It's that this 9-year-old CPU can keep up with the still highly relevant Ryzen 5 5600X, and therefore can probably also contend with relatively modern i5s, at least on the LGA1200 platform. Is this a recommendation to buy? Kinda, yeah. Unlike X79, there aren't too many caveats to the recommendation either, beyond the usual risks associated with buying used equipment. To get the same kind of performance as you've seen in this review, you'll need to overclock the chip to 4.5GHz or higher, and that'll take some pretty intensive cooling. I'd suggest a 280 or 360mm AIO, as although my CPU could manage to hit this frequency at about one4 volts, you might have to be prepared to go higher than that depending on the silicon lottery. When I tried one5 volts, the package temp hit 90 degrees with my 240mm AIO, and that sort of thing isn't going to be sustainable for long. One thing that did catch my eye is the power usage, and I have to assume that my motherboard is misreporting this. According to Afterburner, the three 2014 to 2015 era CPUs I've tested this week are about as energy efficient as modern ones, and that just doesn't seem likely. Although the stock TDP is 140 watts, Hardware Monitor reports package power of just over 50 watts in Cinebench R23 too, so something is definitely amiss. Sadly, I don't have any external hardware for measuring power usage. Another thing to be concerned about is the motherboard. A branded X99 board from ASUS, MSI or Gigabyte will have a lot of modern conveniences, often even featuring things like NVMe drive support, but they might cost more than you want to pay. I tracked one down for £100 on eBay, but they could conceivably be much higher than that, depending on your local used market. There are new options available on AliExpress, but I still don't have any personal experience of them. While you're browsing channels like Mirkonst Hardware and Craft Computing for recommendations on which AliExpress X99 boards are worth buying, bear in mind that with an i7-5960X, you'll definitely want a motherboard that can overclock. Still, if you can pick up one of these CPUs for about £75 and a decent branded motherboard for about £125, you could have a highly capable gaming setup for less than the cost of a decent current-gen motherboard. If this is still a bit rich for you, I have a review of the cheaper 6-core 5930K in the works that, once it's complete, will be on screen... Now, thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.